Hello everyone. Um, welcome to the ninth ACM Sikkai Mumbai chapter meeting, which might not be only in Mumbai at this time. I'm Sugandha, and I welcome you all to the meeting today. It's our first virtual meet. Since we have a lot of new faces from India, and I guess uh, people will be joining us uh, further this time. Could be like from other countries as well. So I would like to give everyone a brief introduction about us. Um, we are the Sikkai Mumbai chapter, consists of academics and professionals from Mumbai, and we have our Sikkai student chapter as well. We started out our monthly in August 2019, and we have not yet broken our streak. Um, we have had talks on cutting edge research from India, books that can influence design and HCI practice, panel discussions, and ethics. For this meet, we have four presentations. We have Mr. Noshad Sheikh, who will share his thoughts on automation and design. And we have Rishi Vankuru and Prachi Tunk presenting their Kai SRC 2020 selected works. And Shishang Desh Pandey, who will share his experience in the industry through his talk on the business of design. So we can start with Noshad if he's ready. Yeah. And um, so uh, if anyone has any questions, I believe they can uh, write them on the chat window as well. So, thank you so much, Sukhandar. Okay, guys, so I'll start uh, my sharing my screen. If you give me a moment. Okay, guys, uh, thank you very much uh, for participating in this talk and being a part of uh, ACM uh, Sikka in ninth talk. And uh, this is a firm. I'm kind of a bit uh, nervous because this is the first virtual meet or uh, presentation as kind of which I'm giving right now. So it's interesting and let's see how it goes by. So uh, the topic that I uh, chose here is um, how does artificial intelligence machine learning uh, is going to influence user, UX and UI design? Where is it today and how will it impact uh, us as designers and uh, overall the software development uh, process and methodology precisely uh, in the near future. So um, to be precise, uh, where do we start with? The areas in which the... Uh, Noshad? Yeah, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, should I, I think I should introduce you first to everyone. Okay, yeah. Uh, so um, Noshad is a designer with a diverse set of roles and experience. He didn't choose design, it happened to him and it has stuck with him now. He knows the power of design and the constraints of business, tech influence, and the outcomes, irrespective of the intent. Most of his work experience includes balancing, juggling, and justifying design in, in, in enterprise as software as a service and software domains. Um, yeah, Noshad, you can continue about what you're going to talk about today. Okay, great. Thanks, Urana. So, what are the areas in which artificial intelligence and machine learning can help us in terms of uh, designing specifically? So what it can help us is uh, the very first area is build softwares. The second is measure. The third is predict. So when we are saying building software, it, it comes to literally the making the, uh, making the interface screens. Uh, so I'd request uh, anyone else to be mute if they feel that they have a, a disturbance in their background. That will be great. Once uh, you're clear with the disturbance, we can uh, turn back on. Thanks. So uh, the first area is building. The second area is measuring. The third area is predicting. So when we speak about building, uh, we are already seeing some progress here in terms of building is that uh, you take a piece of uh, paper, you sketch out something, and then you get visual interfaces, which gets directly transferred in, in the form of code. In terms of measuring, we have a lot of analytics platforms, which until to a great extent now were assisted by humans that they were responsible for, be it Google Analytics or uh, uh, any other uh, mixed panel or any other analytics platform. There, there was human intelligence involved, which was taking care of, okay, where are the drop-offs? What is happening? Uh, whether there is an anomaly or not. Predicting is what do we anticipate? Okay, if this is the pattern of data that we are seeing, it was the human responsibility earlier uh, to say that, okay, this is what could happen and this is the areas of the screens in which something could work or could break. So as a very uh, simple example of uh, measurement is uh, one of the features uh, provided by uh, Full Story, which is an analytics platform. It tracks the clicks by users and if there is a rage click, uh, it measures it in the form of, uh, if there are multiple clicks by the user at a specific point of uh, interface, it measures and tags it as a rage click, which uh, 
we, we would need to understand as designers by conducting a user study, by conducting a usability test session with them and sitting with them. And these kind of patterns may not even be observed by humans because if the user has uh, interfaced it for the first time, he may, he may learn it and then it will be, become part of his memory. So in this talk, the only area that we are going to focus about is the build part. How, how and when, uh, what is the current state of AI and machine learning helping us build user interfaces? In what areas of user, user experience are they already helping us with? So uh, let's talk about the quick story of how it all started. Uh, let me open, go to the full screen. It all started when uh, in around it was 2017 when I was working at, at a firm uh, called as Global e Procure and I did my first heuristic evaluation. And I went through the uh, in groups or 10 specifications about uh, heuristics. And they were pretty exhaustive. What I found was that I, I was able to, uh, to a great extent, at least, uh, 80% of the issues I was able to tag and allocate to the 10 heuristics which are present. Uh, after that, I did that, I, I thought, can this be codified? Can we codify this? What if, if, if a human is doing it right now, can this be done or repeated in such a form that uh, a computer does this on an interface and then the computer just spits out the findings to the humans? So yes, there is a good amount of human uh, input still required, but it still can be codified. So currently in today's date, what are the industries, what are the other areas in which artificial intelligence and machine learning is already helping us? So uh, since then I had been researching of how, uh, how the UI design and user experience design could be automated. So there are a few areas, let's say the very first is, uh, this is the painting which was sold at Christie's uh, at an auction for uh, 430 to $500. And this was made by completely by artificial intelligence. So uh, if I remember it correctly, it is generative adversarial networks. So what that does is it- uh, I'm sorry, uh, Naushad, I'm sorry. Uh, I think your uh, screen is on the other screen or something. Because uh, we are only seeing the first heuristic evaluation on our screen right now. Okay, the, I, I think there could be a bit of lag. I'm right now on the painting screen if, if it's visible. No, it's not yet visible. Okay, let me... Of basically how we define the goals. So the first goal was adjacency preference. And this... So we can hear your sound, but not the screen. Okay, one moment. I think the... Is it visible now? Uh, Nashad, what you can try is stop the screen share and start it again. I think that would be Yeah. I hope it's visible now. Yeah, yeah, now it is visible. Okay, great. So now, uh, yeah, okay, I think I uh, chose a different uh, browser window. Okay, so when I did that heuristic evaluation, I'll just be uh, quick here. Uh, can this be codified? Can this heuristic evaluate, can we automate the process of evaluating, heuristically evaluating uh, uh, a user interface or a screen, put it in the form of code and the, the code can run through. Uh, the way today we already have uh, some automated mechanisms like we have W3 specifications and we can run a piece of code and we get the results saying, okay, these are the specifications which have been uh, complied by and this, these are the specifications which are uh, being violated. So the next point was where else in design, uh, since that time that I had the thought, uh, where else in design is, do we see artificial intelligence and machine learning already creating an impact? So the very first was uh, in terms of paintings, which is completely uh, a, a piece of art. Uh, this painting specifically was generated uh, by uh, an artificial intelligence AI algorithm, and it was sold at Christie's and at an auction. So as we see in the, uh, so what this does is, uh, it follows a generative adversarial networks. So it's a bit of a jargon, but what I understood out of it is that they analyze thousands of artworks which have been previously created and this is a completely new artwork 
as a uh, a genuine new creation by the artificial intelligence next when we go about uh, computer aided design this so this is a, a kind of a long clip but autodesk is doing a good amount of job in terms of uh, computer aided design wherein uh, we have certain set of constraints and we have certain set of so this is an example when in uh, Autodesk is helping the planners and the architects build the layout while understanding the user needs uh, and also having some specific constraints. So I'll quickly play this video. Uh, of basically so how we define the goals. So the first goal was adjacency preference and this basically means minimizing the travel distance between collaborating teams and preferred amenities. Uh, the second goal is work style preference and this means basically taking each team and uh, looking at the suitability of its neighborhood or its location to its preferred light and acoustic levels. Uh, the third is buzz, and this is basically defined as so I'll just fast minimizing visual bit. the outside. And this is defined as maximizing so the exterior, find the constraints, and where uh, lines as the kind of center line. Uh, and define number four is defined. So as we see in this video, uh, we have a specific layout and we have some spe specific constraints and we have the needs of the human beings who will habitat that office. And that could be in the form of lighting, in the form of office space, in the form of how do they want to collaborate. Uh, all of these constraints are fed into the system uh, in this software Autodesk. And then Autodesk creates n number of variations, literally hundreds of variations of this layout while keeping in line the constraints and the rules that have been given. So this is another example of wherein it's software here is rhinoceros and the other one is grasshopper. So we can see that the, the layout of a house and then the mapping of other elements of what can be done within that house are also being done. So next, uh, so I'm being a little fast here because I see that I have 10 minutes remaining. So in terms of very specifically in terms of UI and UX, we see there are at least three specific uh, contenders in terms of one of them being uh, uh, UIZAR, which uh, is focusing on converting sketch to code, coded functional prototypes. So you supply it a sketch, paper sketch, and it converts it to, into a coded prototype. Right now they are doing it only for mobile screens and um, hopefully someday they would be able to scale it up to a complete web screen. So we have Microsoft AI uh, division, uh, which is a Microsoft garage venture, I believe. Sketch to code in which it's a similar concept of you have the UI uh, sketched and then you get it converted into the uh, visual design specifically. What's interesting is that the guys at UIZard have done is you can export your design system link, uh, be it in Sketch or probably in Figma right now. Uh, they had it in Sketch a, uh, a few months ago. You can export your design system and provide it to them. The next time the algorithm detects a button as a primary button, it will fetch it from your design system and place it in the form of that. So you don't have to redo everything again and again. And this is what most of us would already know. This was a pro functional prototype created by uh, Airbnb, wherein you just, in real time, you push in an image, a sketch, and it converts it to a functional coded prototype while keeping in mind the Airbnb design, the design system. So now we come to how about having all of these done. What is the requirement for AI machine learning and automation? So AI first needs to, needs a lot of data to learn. And then from that data, we need to run it through a, a good amount of code, make it learn, and then it will be able to interpret it. And then it'll be able to predict what layout, what UI elements, what can be done. And then ultimately it helps us build, it builds it, builds the pieces of the interface and then we can evaluate it and then we can inspect it. And this cycle gets repeated. So when we talk about what is the data that we can supply to the artificial uh, AI, the, the very first few of them, which uh, I could think of over, over this good period was that, all of the laws of UX which have been codified, say for example, uh, Hicks law, Fitz law, and uh, these things, they, if they can be converted into formulas, I'm not very precise of whether they can be or they cannot be, there's a possibility. Uh, we have the accessibility specifications in terms of um, level A, double A, AA, and triple A. 
we have design systems. So let's say if there's a firm which has a design system, they can use an existing design system and supply it as a data to the artificial intelligence. Next is we have the pattern libraries, which, which are already available across the globe. Many of the companies have made them open source. Uh, and then we have crowdsourced data, which we as designers do on a day-to-day -day basis before we go on a design. Uh, after we have understood the user needs, we go and see how others are trying to solve this problem. Whether our users, uh, if our users are using Microsoft or Google, we could try and remix something of that sort so that it's still relevant for the users and it's still usable. So in terms of um, the code needs structure. So if let's say if I take an example of a very simple instruction, okay, go and wear your socks. Uh, it's very simple for the human to get up and move away and then uh, pick up the socks and then rightly wear it. But if we give this, these instructions to a computer, the computer will be, uh, will be very confused as to what it has to do and it'll get it stuck. So let's say if I'm sitting on a chair right now, the computer will not know whether I have to turn right or I have to turn left. So on the on my left, I have the cupboard, but the computer doesn't, doesn't know that. So the computer has to be given precise instructions. So how do we give the precise instructions? So when I was researching, I came to know that in terms of modeling the literal user interface, we already have a specification which is known as uh, Maria XML. Uh, which helps us define the UI on what can be interacted and what are the actions possible and what all the uh, user interface elements are uh, possible. In terms of when we understand the user needs, we are to an extent uh, when we are following the agile practice, we are to a good extent converting them, them to user stories. Uh, is there a question? Okay, I'll continue. We'll, we can take the questions uh, a little later. And then we have the user flows. So uh, there are some parts of it which is uh, which we may see that, okay, can the AI not do user flows and screen flows as well? AI can possibly do it, but I'll come to the next point on, in today's situation, what do I feel that the AI can do immediately and what I foresee that the AI could do? So right now we will have to supply the system, the user flow saying, okay, the user will start here and the user will end here, uh, end the task here. In terms of screen flows as well, we will have to group and map it and give it to the system. So uh, as we know, uh, this is the uh, elements of user experience. The user needs and site objectives are already defined. These are done by the UX researchers. They go to the users and the product owners. They go to the users. They understand the requirements along with the business requirements and then fuse them together. The functional specifications are the user stories which are created. And then we have the content requirements. So when the functional stories, uh, the user stories and the content requirements have the right information priority as well, it will help the system also take and create the information design. What can be done is the visual design and the information design in the very current form, in the very immediate future. What's difficult to do is the information architecture that will certainly need human assistance as to uh, building up on the content. How can we structure it so that, okay, do we need three screens or do we need 10 screens? Is it a mobile interface or is it a web interface? Can we lay out uh, information relatively sparsely or do we need to make it really compact? So uh, what are the future roles uh, that I see that uh, will have an impact because of the automation that we anticipate? So this automation and uh, uh, input of AI and ML is also very far-sighted, but uh, I'm certain it will happen because uh, right now there are no products the way Autodesk and Rhinoceros are doing it in their areas, we don't have an, uh, an organization which is focusing on that uh, level right now. So right now we have a lot of people who are uh, generalists but not experts. What I foresee is that there will be a requirement for experts, let's say purely uh, user researchers rather than I'm a researcher, I'm an interaction designer and I'm a visual designer as well. And less of UX engineers required. So uh, a good number of organizations today uh, which have a high UX maturity have uh, UX engineers who convert the sketches to functional prototypes, uh, which can be then tested with the users. 
this requirement will go down significantly and these roles will need to repurpose themselves to other roles because a good amount of it is already happening as i gave you an example of with uizard and others the role of ux inspectors uh, the people who do the heuristic evaluation and the expert reviews will increase significantly is because uh, till the time the ai uh, gets perfect or near perfect we will still need the human intervention to feed back to the ai saying okay this is what you had created but this is how it's happening or this is how it's not working it this is the area wherein the human intervention will be required the humans will tell the system again in a structured form saying okay let's go back and let's uh, alter the uh, algorithm and let it learn and repeat it again so what appears to be complex uh, in the hypothetical approach that i have uh, thought of it's uh, i could not imagine a way in which the ai could do could solve data visualization challenges i could not imagine how the ai could solve the ui decisions of whether it should be a pop up whether it should be a page do we really need a tooltip uh, also a question remains is how will this kind of workflow integrate with the current software development uh, processes we already have a lot of processes which is agile waterfall and then we have hybrid and then uh, we have companies who are experimenting with newer methodologies so yes uh, that's precisely from my end uh, i'm happy to answer questions uh, that we have from the team So oh, thanks, uh, Naushad. Uh, is there any questions? So can you stop sharing your screen so that we can see if people are putting up their hand? Yeah, I've just stopped. Yeah, good. Are there any questions? I have one question which I can see in the chat. If there are no verbal questions, I can do that. Yeah, you can go ahead. So uh, Anand has asked, uh, Hi Naushad, what's the status of using AI ML in design of virtual reality products? Anant, uh, uh, to be honest, I have not explored that area. I'll, I'll need to check that. On, uh, so, no, I can't answer that right now. Any other questions? Um, I, I have something, Nashal. Yeah. Um, and Gyan and then Rupam. So the, the tools that, um, at, at least the current state of the technology seems like if you have a design system and if you, you sort of have, say, sketches <clears throat> mm -hmm. or something, then you can convert those into a well laid out uh, uh, UI pattern library, uh, I mean, UI design in something like Figma and all. Yeah. So I, can, I see that being automated, uh, but... Uh, does that system still not require a human input in terms of that initial sketch or layout or someone still needs to give it that amount of information? Yes. Yes. So that amount of information is, will be required. So as we see that, uh, so I'll, I will need to share the screen a moment again, but I'll show you to the area. So what is the data that uh, the system will need? The data right now at this stage, the AI, uh, I don't see it mature enough to know, okay, uh, can I group, uh, five fields together. So I'll give you an example from this screen. Uh, your screen is still not yet on. Okay. On. Uh, because the way I see it, uh, a lot of UI designers will already use uh, um, pre-made libraries of uh, UI elements and then just kind of mix and match them. So right. the right. problem that this is solving is just converting an I into uh, the rectangles on a screen but i don't i don't feel like that is all that ui designers do uh, in, since there is also requirement gathering and then converting those into a layout and <laughs> yeah. and do you see ai being able to do that part of the job as well uh, so yes ai will not be able to replace the role of ux researchers and product owners in terms of understanding what are the requirements the balancing between the user requirements the business needs and the technical constraints that's not what i i don't uh, foresee that ai will be able to do it so i'll give you an example with reference to this screen specifically so let's say uh, if we take the bathroom the living room library guest room and these as screens so 
if we map it according to our uh, design process, we say that okay, these are the individual uh, modules or pieces of sub modules of a software in which there are more areas which we can do. Okay? So the software will have, it, it will be uh, a very step-by-step -step process wherein you learn to crawl first. This is the crawling step wherein uh, the humans will let that system learn. Okay, if I have so much of information, uh, I would want to group it in a bigger part, which I will uh, make it as the lobby. If I have less information, I'll put it in the uh, so-and-so area. If I have uh, some specific utility, I'll do it this way. And then the system will learn from these inputs. It's specifically the interaction design part, which is what areas can be helped with the help with the help of AI, which is interaction design, information architecture, uh, interface design, navigation design, and visual design. I don't see, I don't foresee that the functional specification, the green layer and the yellow layer being replaced with that. I hope that answers. Okay, so if we can narrow, specify the problem narrowly enough, then uh, within, then the problem space can be explored uh, with these systems. But as of now, someone still needs to give the constraints to the system. Definitely, definitely. So as we see from the example of AutoCAD, they have been learning and doing this thing since years, probably 10, 15 years. That amount of time will also need to be spent by some organization, some uh, corporate from probably Adobe or some of those lights, and then get it in the structured format. Okay, thank you so much. Rupa, you wanted to ask something? Yeah. Uh, hi, Anusha. Uh, first of all, great presentation. Uh, second, uh, just wanted to ask that uh, you spoke about how we can convert laws of UX and other critical laws into some kind of a metric. And the question I around uh, had around that is, uh, even though if we are somehow able to manage uh, something into a metric, for example, law of association or something like that, uh, there is a level of calling, there is a le level of decision making that a particular human makes and even that can vary from designer to designer. Agreed. So how do you think we can make a uniformity with this in, in the field of design? In the code, in the world of coding that exists in terms of auto deployment and all. But how do you think we can do that in uh, design? There is only a, a certain amount of certainty with that we can bring, okay? Because design is already subjective. The design is subjective and we have to get all the contexts which are involved. Something that works for Google will not work for others. Something that works for US will not work for India. Let's say if yeah. we uh, hypothetically say that we take the uh, UK.gov design system and maybe implement it in India, it will not work because we are multilingual and we have so many languages. What it can help is from the example that you gave is that, um, law of association, the spacing. Uh, can we define the spacing in our design system? Yes, we can. So that our, we are firstly providing the input and then the system will learn from it. And the second part is it will, all, it will remain subjective to a greater extent. It will not take away the jobs. It will minimize the in, uh, input required by each roles. So let's say that's the reason what I foresee is that the uh, heuristic, uh, the expert reviewers and the people who do the critique at the end, that job will still remain because they will need to look at the output and see, okay, this doesn't, the AI has done its job depending on the constraints which were provided, but it doesn't look good. Or we did the usability test with the output provided by the AI, it's not working. I feel that interference will still be required. 